um, Yale program in Iranian studies, uh, the Macmillan Center, uh, and uh, the Yale School of uh, Architecture. This is a um, panel that we are uh, particularly um, excited about. This comes uh, at, at a culmination of a very difficult but very productive year uh, for us here at Yale. We had uh, 10 sessions of um, uh, Iran colloquium series, which consisted of uh, presentations by some very distinguished uh, speakers. And um, on its own, um, we think this is a very timely and important gathering. This is uh, giving uh, us a chance to bring Iranian studies to the growing literature that focuses on the modern city. Um, we, as, as such, we will hope that uh, our discussion will engage with the in contradictory impulses of the modernist project. It's uh, emancipatory uh, possibilities that uh, promise bringing comfort and efficiency to, to the urban life and um, allowing for new forms of being in the world, new forms of cosmopolitan engagements, and, uh, but also its normative and disciplinary registers, which, which uh, those who are with this, he would know that it, it particularly was enforced uh, during the 1930s, um, which uh, in so many ways brought uh, the kind of uh, modernization that was in, in place, were brought uh, social fragmentation, widening of social gaps uh, and um, uh, some radical interventions in the very body of the Iranian cities. Uh, and including in that uh, came with it um, the erasure of the past. Uh, this also would uh, uh, engage, uh, we hope, with uh, a scholarship on heritage and memory, where the, when there is erasure, there is also re-emergence uh, of the importance of memory. And aside from all those things, this is uh, uh, an issue, a topic, a theme that touches our lives and has touched our lives in so many ways. Many of us have stories or mem family memories of, of the homes and neighborhoods that were changed um, radically during the lifetime of ourselves or, or, or people immediate in the immediate past. I would uh, like to really welcome uh, the three distinguished um, guest speakers today who accepted uh, our invitations. I'll start with a short biography uh, of uh, Dr. Susan Babai. Uh, Dr. Babai is a professor of Islamic and Iranian arts at the Courtauld um, University of London. Her research interests include the early modern Safari period with topics on urbanism and empire studies, on sexuality and social habits of seeing, and on transcultural visuality and notions of exoticism. Among her publications, uh, are the award-winning 2008 book, Isfahan and its Palaces, Statecraft, Shiism, and the Architecture of Conviviality in Early Modern Iran. And several co-authored books, uh, she, her, her um, um, uh, list of publications is so immense, I only have to choose a few from them. Um, uh, and she has co-authored books also and uh, articles, including with um, uh, Talin Gerigor, the 2014 book, Persian Kingship and Architecture, Strategies of Power in Iran, from the Achaemenids to the Pahlavis. Her exhibitions include the guest uh, curated Strolling in Isfahan at the Sackler Gallery Museum of Harvard University in 2010. Uh, Susan was president of, of the Historians of Islamic Art Association and is the incoming president of the Association for the Study of Persian Societies. Our next uh, presenter 
will be uh, Talin Gerigor, who is the uh, chair of the Department of Art and Art History at the University of California, Davis. Uh, her research focuses on 19th and 20th century art and architectural histories through the framework of post-colonial and critical theories grounded in Iran and, and Parsi India. Her books include, and um, I, I have to say that she has the most handsome books uh, uh, imaginable. You, you really need to pay attention to their covers also. Her books include uh, Building Iran, Modernism, Architecture, and National Heritage until the Pahlavi uh, Monarchs from in 2009, Contemporary Iranian Art from the Streets to the Studio, uh, which came out in 2014, and the Persian Revival, the Imperialism of the Copy in Iranian and Parsi Architecture, very recent book from this year, 2021. I'm uh, particularly uh, delighted to, to uh, introduce our next, uh, 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 our final uh, presenter, uh, somebody who's known to many of you uh, uh, for sure, um, Hossein Amonat. Hossein Amonat is a graduate of Tehran University. In 1966, he was the winner of a nationwide competition to design the Shah Yad, now also the Freedom Monument, which was completed in 1971. Over the past moment, uh, this monument has played an uh, iconographic backdrop to a diverse array of political gatherings. Many of us uh, know those images uh, with, with um, the uh, Azadi Shahya Tower in the background. While in Iran, he also designed and built other significant structures, including uh, the one for Center for Handicrafts, now headquarters of Iran's cultural heritage organization. And, and an organization that is extremely um, powerful and influential uh, in today's Iran, and it, it carries a uh, lot of weight in shaping um, different parts of uh, cities, uh, particularly the older parts of um, uh, many cities. Arya Mer, now Sharif University uh, buildings and libraries were also uh, designed by um, and, and, uh, uh, Mr. Amonat, and the University of Tehran School of Management. He also designed the Iranian embassy in Beijing, a distinct um, uh, edifice in the diplomatic quarter of, of the Chinese capital. Since 1980, uh, in Vancouver, uh, Mr. Amonat's practice has expanded and diversified. So uh, without uh, taking much of uh, more of your time, I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Babway to, to start with her presentation. Thank you very much for your very generous introduction. I am indeed uh, delighted to be in the company of uh, Mr. Amonat and Talin Gergor uh, talking about architecture of modern Iran. And I'm not the, uh, the one specialized in architecture of modern Iran. Uh, if I may start my uh, share screen, and then I would like to uh, just say a word about the fact that there is a very high likelihood that my internet does not uh, quite carry me through always in, in good shape. I'm in rural Wales uh, on the first holiday trip after a year and a half and absolutely delighted to join everyone from all over the place and colleagues at Yale. Uh, in Connecticut. So I, um, I want to uh, start by actually pointing to the fact that modernity and modernization uh, do require thinking a little bit, perhaps problematizing a bit. Uh, but that I will leave for the discussion at the end, thinking about what does modernization actually mean. Uh, I work on Esfahan primarily of the 17th century, uh, the period of uh, the development of the new Esfahan uh, 
under the reign of Shah Abbas I and starting from late 16th century and continuing well into the beginning of 18th century. So it's about 130 years of development, uh, successive waves of development of the city, which transformed it into one of the uh, most important uh, uh, cosmopolitan cities uh, of the early modern period. And uh, the competition was nowhere near it in say Paris or London or, or Rome. Rather, you would com compare Esfahan to Beijing, Delhi, and Istanbul. And that, that itself should uh, sort of keep us in a particular place, at least uh, historically, if, if I were to put it that way. It was a city that became hugely important around its Maidan. And in, um, in honor of uh, Hossein Amonat, I want to bring uh, the Maidan issue, which I'd like to speak about in a, in a rather brief sort of overview, and uh, the question of the pedestrian or the Maidan on foot, uh, as the Maidan of Esfahan was. Uh, not to uh, dismayingly say the Maidan uh, Shahiyad or Azadi, as it has been renamed after 1979. Uh, was not the right kind of Maidan. I'll, I'll discuss what is the right kind of Maidan later on. But to say that this incredible um, venture, which was really a, a different thing than the Maidan that we talk about um, as in, a, uh, as in a, a public square of the city, regulating a lot of aspects of life, uh, Maidan Shahiyad or Azadi was not intended as such. It was intended as uh, a formal uh, entrance into the city of Tehran, as it were, it stood uh, at the entrance as one arrived from the Mehrabad airport. Now, all of this has changed, but it proved to be an incredibly important site for all kinds of uh, activities that brought millions of people to it. I leave this one. Uh, I hope that uh, Hussein will talk about it. My goal is actually to think about Maidan in, in scaled format, to think in terms of uh, neighbor, neighborhood Maidans, in other words, the kind that we know from Aleppo's Sahat uh, al-Hatab, uh, which is in the Jadaida quarter of Aleppo. Uh, to think of Cairo's uh, Maidan, which is one of the uh, core areas with the old buildings remaining, but not necessarily as active in terms of social life, in terms of shopping, hanging out, strolling, and so forth. Uh, Maidan -e Kuchak in Nujolfa of Esfahan, or every European city's medieval market square of which I just uh, have the uh, Ben Castle, uh, but one can think of everywhere, pretty much. Uh, Toledo, thinking about Krakow or anywhere else that these medieval market squares remain. In all of these, the scale is more in terms of a neighborhood. The Maidan that we uh, come to see in Esfahan is an, uh, on a completely different scale and, um, and thinking in terms of urban organization. In some ways, what uh, in fact um, was uh, noted in terms of regulating life is part of the grand plan of the Maidan of Esfahan where a vast public square uh, entirely accessible to the city's denizens, uh, a place for as much for royal entertainment, let's say polo playing or equestrian exercises and processions of ambassadors uh, gifts, uh, as it was for daily markets, for just strolling about, for watching events and watching illuminations and traversing the entire length of it 
from the north, which was the, uh, the uh, new bazaar entrance, royal bazaar entrance, all the way to the new congregational mosque of the city, masjid e jamia Abbasi, the first time the Safavids built a congregational mosque uh, and Esfahan is identified now as a new city, this part of this Esfahan, which is appended to the old Saljur or medieval city of, of Esfahan. In every respect, from what we know in terms of descriptions uh, and especially European uh, travelers' accounts and their obsession with depicting and describing the Maidan and Ahsha Jahan, the image of the world as it was called already in the 17th century. From all those uh, 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 descriptive and visual uh, um, evidence on the Maidan, we know that this was a place where the pedestrian was privileged indeed, that it was a shopping arcade that surrounded its peripheries. It was where people came to cross and get to the mosque on Friday noontime. It's where people uh, encountered one another, that there were cafes and taverns uh, and even places of this repute in its, it, in its per, uh, periphery, that it was really a gathering place, a place of sociability, a place for social encounters in ways that are uh, extraordinarily uh, um, uh, new in terms of thinking about it. So there is a form of modernity here that is uh, highly significant at this early period, late 16th century into early 17th century. The contemporary of the Maidan of Esfahan is Place Royale, or uh, also known as Place de Vosges in Paris, which cuts a square, a perfect square in the midst of medieval Paris under the orders of uh, uh, Henry IV. Uh, and indeed, it, it was meant to be a square for royal processions and gatherings, but entirely given to uh, the residences of the uh, court elite, in fact, and not a city, as an urban square, the way, say, market squares of the medieval city ha had been, and nor like the square of, uh, of uh, Esfahan, in fact. We know that equivalents of this had existed elsewhere. Uh, the Hippodrome of the Ottoman Istanbul, for instance, becomes by 17th century much more richly endowed with the addition of the Sultan Ahmed Mosque on one side, but remains very much a, a, a square for, uh, for formal receptions and processions where the Ottoman Sultan saw people and people saw him. In Iran, actually, in the period under discussion that is 17, 16th and 17th centuries, Esfahan is probably the largest, most, um, most regulated, best planned, if you will, for all the functions that it brings into this uh, public square at such a high uh, or large scale. Others were also designed in this period. One example is the city of Kerman, where we find added to the bazaar or the covered market route, a square which itself begins to re-regulate the traffic of the city and create a nodal point where the Maidan of Ganjali Khan, as you see on the lower uh, uh, right, was uh, as well a place for gathering of people, for strolling, but also a marketplace to the corner of it, including what we see here, a crossing of the markets with a domed uh, chaharsu, a, a public bathhouse, a mint, a cistern, and so forth. So the, the sorts of ensembles of con construction and articulation of urban life, of urbanity happen in more than uh, Esfahan in the 16th and 17th centuries. I'm gonna jump forward for the fact that what we understand to be the age of modernization, uh, a 
native modernity, if you will, is what we see in the Qajar period, that is 19th century in Iran. And I show you uh, Maidan Arg, which was the, uh, the Maidan or square at the entrance into the palace precinct, which lies uh, in a vast uh, compound, walled compound, but was really a formal or a ceremonial space for audiences primarily and not for public uh, public display if you will of everyday life not for encounters tehran from the qajar period onwards rethinks the idea of a maidan which was the maidan basically of the safavi period in 16th and 17th centuries in the city of esfahan in kerman in Tabriz in Ghazvin and so forth, rethinks that one as part of a modernizing aspect of urban development about which actually Talin has written quite a bit. And I just want to share with you a few examples of these. The Hassanabad Square in Southern Tehran, which was indeed one of those uh, great urban spaces uh, inside of which was originally a statue. So some feature of, uh, of uh, centering of the Maidan comes about, maybe even a traffic uh, roundabout that identifies the centrality or centering uh, feature of the Maidan and then buildings around it, which gave a regular uh, spatial arrangement. But all of these maidans become uh, sites for, uh, for regulating traffic in, in the most uh, instances that we know. Of course, the cars come in later, but nonetheless, the, the in, uh, in large spaces, the scale is massive, but they do not include uh, spaces for the pedestrian. The pedestrianization of Esfahan uh, by way of its Maidan, but also a boulevard, which I haven't had time to talk about, uh, is completely uh, discarded in the process of modernization of the city of Tehran. That's when we see aspects of mobility, of, of regularity, of uh, marching of armies, of sort of display of the uh, the top down uh, becomes much more important in such instances. Uh, the Meidane uh, Toubkhane or Artillery Barracks Square, Meidane Toubkhane, which was commissioned as part of a sort of modernizing uh, agenda. It's an enterprise of Amir Kabir, the chief minister of Nasreddin Shah. Uh, all of this, of course, is material that uh, Professor has, uh, Abbasa Amanat has written a lot about, that these kinds of maidans became sites for branching of new streets. So the new streets uh, that go out of a maidan such as Tupkhane will reach to other maidans. I only show one of them, Maidan Ferdosi, where uh, the center of the maidan, again, a statue of Ferdosi, the poet, and then branching of more of uh, streets, major streets. In all of these instances, Meidane Bishare Esfand, which was near the uh, University of Tehran, I remember as a, a teenager, but also as a young university student, uh, uh, frequenting these Meidans with a very sort of a um, a, a clear uh, sense of the alienation of the pedestrian from this uh, fast moving uh, traffic. That was the sole um, intention of a design like that. These have more affinities with designs in, for instance, Kiev's uh, famous Maidan, uh, which was the site of uh, uprisings of the uh, 2014 revolution or the Tahrir Square in Cairo. 
where again, you don't stroll about these places the way you would stroll in the Maidan of Esfahan. This is partly, in fact, connected to what Aliye Madanipur has talked about in terms of the modernist tenet of breaking with the past, that in fact, Tehran's 1972 onwards uh, sort of city planning, which was given to a Greek architect, uh, was thought of in terms of science and the science of regulating spaces. So that in the process, the context of use was entirely uh, lost. But uh, in fact, the pedestrian was made uh, basically a pawn in making the city what it was. What I find really curious and interesting now is the attempt, this is a recent attempt, to build new urban environments for that kind of uh, regathering. Uh, you would think that this is the mall of today elsewhere. There is a mall like this in, in California. Tallinn once took me to this to this massive space in Southern California where everything happens in there. In this case, this is called Bazare Buzurge Nahshe Jahane Andishe. Andishe being a new city, relatively new city, west of Tehran. In, in other words, moving away. And there you have what is called Bazare Irani Islami. Uh, and in really two stories, it it recalls uh, with its mosque and shops, it recalls the Maidan of Esfahan in every respect that I can think of. So that's the last of what I wanted to say with the understanding that Tehran is packed with new Maidans. Many of them seem to be reflecting something not of the Maidan ideas of earlier periods, but those of housemen and the housemanization of, in fact, Paris. In other words, a different kind of modernity has entered the scene compared to what we perhaps can see in the current uh, environment. And I thank you very much and stop sharing so that I can come back. I hope I didn't take too much time. Oh, that's very good. Thank you, Dr. Belvai. Um, and next we'll move on to Dr. Grigor. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Susanjan, for that um, um, incredible um, lecture uh, setting up uh, what I'm going to talk about. I wanna thank um, Dr. Amonat and Dr. Honer Pichet for this invitation. It's really an honor to be on this panel. Um, it's very special because um, uh, um, Dr. Babai was on my co um, uh, dissertation committee and uh, Mr. Amanat was the first Iranian architect I interviewed, actually the first person I interviewed um, when I was a student. Um, I went to Vancouver. He very generously invited um, um, uh, Mr. Sehun to his house. And so that's how I really began my uh, career um, in, in, in that kind of um, a very generous environment. Um, so this, this, this talk is uh, very special. Um, so I'm, let me share my screen. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, Professor Babai talked about um, space making uh, in um, um, modern, early modern Iran and modern Iran. Um, and um, um, I, I would like to talk about form making um, and how it um, uh, uh, transformed Tehran as the capital city of the uh, of the uh, Nasreddin Shah and then. Um, the Pahlavis. Um, and here the modern movement in Iran is very important um, uh, because uh, uh, the, um, what we talk about this conflict between 
uh, form and space really uh, becomes dominant um, in the discourses of um, modern architecture in Europe. And uh, especially the uh, modern movement, uh, which was a particular group of people in Europe who got together around the Siam and um, uh, and uh, had these declarations about the divorce of architecture from uh, politics um, and uh, uh, and focused on form. Um, and uh, at the center of this modern movement from the beginning, from the very beginning, from the first Congress uh, uh, in Switzerland in 1928 was an Iranian. Uh, uh, Gabriel Gevrekian was uh, one of the organizers of the conference, was one of the uh, brains behind the uh, modern movement. Um, he went on to uh, 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 present a, a model building at the center of a work bond exhibition in Vienna. Um, and, uh, and he founded one of the um, most important architectural journals, uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, which is still present. And when uh, uh, the Nazis uh, rose to power and were particularly uh, against the modern movement because they considered it some um, a Bolshevik uh, Jewish plot, um, uh, the uh, heads of the modern movement, they began to uh, disperse and uh, Gevrekian was invited uh, in 1933 to come to Tehran and become the chief architect of, of the city. And this is precisely when Reza Shah is eliminating uh, um, um, major chunks of uh, Nasreddin Shah's Tehran, destroying uh, uh, 11 of the 12 um, gates of Tehran, the fortification of Tehran. And so it's really um, sort of a dream uh, come true uh, for uh, modernists where they have a tabula rasa, uh, where things are being destroyed, forms are being destroyed, spaces are being destroyed, and it opens up uh, 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 sort of these modernist uh, opportunities uh, to design buildings. And so um, in my larger project, I asked why uh, uh, under Reza Shah, there was this uh, um, sort of why were uh, Reza Shah's architect, um, so many of them came from religious minorities, uh, given that Reza Shah's nationalism was very uh, uh, centered on the uh, Persian ethno-nationalism. Um, um, uh, so looking at who made form in, uh, in modern Tehran, uh, so uh, this then connects with Susan's talk about the development of uh, space and form in Tehran, uh, very gradually, uh, but very systematically from the uh, Nasreddin Shah's uh, urban reform in the 1860s, to Reza Shah's urban reform in the uh, late 20s and 30s, and eventually in the 60s by Mohammad Reza Shah. There is, so there is a systematic uh, struggle by architects and urban planners to design Tehran to be a modern city. And uh, it sort of gradually moves up. Um, and so in this attempt of uh, uh, destroying uh, medieval, uh, walls and gates and bringing in space in these modern maidans, um, uh, there was an emphasis on, on form. Um, and this coincided with some of the reforms, the social reforms the, uh, that Nasreddin Shah uh, had initiated and uh, sort of um, Nasreddin Shah's long reign um, and what it, uh, uh, the possibilities of, of modernizing, becoming modern in forms like um, the missionaries become powerful and then in reaction to that, uh, religious minority began to set up secular schools. And so here I'm showing uh, the Armenian school, uh, uh, one of the Armenian schools at the top, uh, the uh, Jewish school, the um, and eventually, and on the bottom, the Baha'i schools uh, that are producing uh, these secular sort of uh, professionals uh, um, that eventually will become um, uh, the Reza Shah's and Mohammed Reza Shah's architect. So 
religious minorities were uh, foundational to this building uh, a secular nation based on form. Um, and uh, and, and uh, the architecture of these schools um, that eventually in 1934, 36, that period uh, become um, nationalized. So then they become homes for a cosmopolitan environment for all Iranians. Um, uh, Alborz was, uh, for example, very important of uh, producing the secular elite of the nation. And the schools themselves had a particular architecture. So um, uh, you're seeing here the um, Anushirvan uh, school with uh, sponsors by the Parsis uh, of India. It has a particularly uh, Achaemenid revival language, but this one, for example, a little bit later, an Armenian school has a modernist language. Uh, so your secular education went along with some kind of an architectural aesthetics. So there is, a, um, uh, uh, Susan talked about how there is a correlation between Maidan making and the visibility of the king going back to, uh, of course, Nash Jahan. Um, uh, my argument is that in starting from the 20s, we are seeing a um, symbolic replacement of form because now architecture comes to stand as a signifier of the king and the secular nation. So the king doesn't need to be seen uh, in the way that the, he needed to be seen in the context of the Safavids and the Rajars. Now architecture form stands in their place. And Reza Shah's ministers, uh, those who sort of shaped uh, modern Iran, uh, were in line with this notion. And it was actually um, uh, 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 Firuz Mirza and Davar who invited Guyav Rakyan to come and become uh, the chief architect of these ministries who were act doing the building at the time to guarantee the look of Tehran. And so uh, the first thing that he did um, uh, was to design um, um, uh, the theater. Um, uh, and then uh, he began to uh, propose a um, um, number of other buildings the Minister of Industries, um, and um, uh, he designed the Ministry of Justice, although here we're starting to see uh, um, a disagreement between the state's push for a revivalistic language with his very uh, adamant, uh, rigid notions about uh, minimalism, uh, white walls, uh, austere facades, use of glass. Um, and, and so by 1937, he leaves, he's only there for a few years, he leaves uh, Iran, but before leaving the, the place where he was able to be very free were these um, uh, villas in northern Tehran. Uh, he designed a, a number of them and because he had a sort of a, a, pa a patron, an independent patron, who wanted to look modern, he uh, was able to implement his international style principles uh, where you can see the open plan, the uh, um, horizontal windows, um, uh, this modernist look that was not uh, revivalistic. Uh, the Officers Club was uh, his last project that actually he never finished because probably uh, his conflict with the state um, and he, act, he, he handed it to um, uh, Vartan Havanesian, who finished it. Uh, Vartan was another of these staunch modernists, um, um, also trained in Paris. Um, he, he, com he, he comes back from Europe after uh, almost a decade there. The first building he designs is the Girls Art Academy. Uh, and here he's implementing complete, he's sort of very far from any notions of Maidan or Maidan making or, or space making. He is fully um, in, in, um, uh, in the business of making form and modernist form with, again, this is a display of the international style at its best. 
you have everything, you have the horizontal window, you have these corners that meet uh, and become glass and um, uh, balconies uh, that uh, uh, open up into classrooms. Uh, and of course, it's a, a school for girls and it's school for art. Uh, he goes on to create a very large architectural firm uh, in which he employs women. Uh, uh, after Le Corbusier, he comes up with his own five point plus two pl uh, points of architecture. Uh, he contributes to the tourist um, industry uh, with uh, uh, the Dadband um, um, Hotel. Uh, the Jeep um, and um, um, cinemas, um, uh, going to the cinema, it was a, a controversial um, a modernist uh, act. And uh, with Irad Moshiri, he uh, launches the first uh, architectural journal in Iran, L'Architect, in which he uh, very adamantly uh, uh, is, is against the revivalistic movement of the early 1920s and third and early 30s uh, with a famous architect like Andre Godard and Nicolas Markov uh, and uh, Karim Tires of the Besat. Uh, he they are adamantly the modernists are adamantly against this kind of looking back into history, this kind of searching for Ir the Iranian modern. And actually, he makes fun of in the journal. He makes fun of the uh, Reza Shah's favorite uh, national bank, calling it uh, trying to turn um, uh, Tehran into a zoo with uh, all these cows in. Um, so, uh, so there is a new generation uh, of uh, architects who are uh, coming up in the 60s and um, Mr. Amonat was of course uh, the paramount example of it. Uh, I think I got this photograph during our first interview. I took the picture from, I think it, this picture was in your office, so I took a picture of it. Um, um, you would have to tell me if this is you afterwards. Uh, but these, by the uh, 60s, large ministries, uh, the oil company, uh, the planning company, all of these large uh, in, uh, entities hire uh, these architects to design modernist buildings. Um, uh, the Shah's great ambitions, his mega projects, uh, all of these are contribute. There is a demand for these um, um, architects. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, I'm not seeing any chats. Uh, so, um, uh, um, so a few of these architects, um, um, Hushang Sehun uh, was a Baha'i, um, uh, uh, Aftan Dilyan uh, 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 was an Armenian, um, Oshana was um, a Syrian, and actually he was hired by Susan's parents. Uh, uh, to design one of these villas. Um, uh, Voskanyan uh, was an Armenian. Um, and of course, um, uh, Hossein Amonat was a Baha'i. All of them are uh, uh, from these margins of the society once. Now they are building the nation. Uh, I also uh, see women as, as mo uh, these liminal entities that are coming to play a major role in this form uh, making Tehran sort of shape making uh, and uh, Farah was very central herself as an architect, uh, also a graduate of one of these um, uh, secular schools. Um, uh, the first female graduate of Tehran University School of Architecture was Nektar uh, pa uh, Papazian Andreev, uh, um, uh, an Armenian, um, and uh, uh, Saginian, also a graduate of Tehran University, um, who was later hired by Saint Hoon, um, uh, was also an Armenian. And I want to finish with this extraordinary photograph of uh, Saginian. Uh, at the Crown Hall at IIT, uh, sitting just a few feet from um, uh, Ms. Van der Rohe. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gregor. Um, and next we will have a presentation by Mr. Amanat. Uh, uh, 
Am I okay on sharing or do you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, I, uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor and great pleasure to be in this panel with dear Susan, Dr. Babai, and uh, dear Talin, and uh, old friends of mine. And uh, I really uh, benefit from what I hear from their talks. Uh, and my thanks to Yale University and uh, organizers of this panel. I would like uh, to start uh, with a memory of a piece of architecture in Kashan, uh, which it's always amazing to me, uh, the geometry of its uh, dome and uh, how it, this expertise and craft uh, was so magnificent and it was forgotten. This is only 200 years ago. And it was at least when I was studying architecture in Iran, uh, we used to travel and sketch these buildings, uh, but all of them are like uh, pieces of uh, objects that I'm not sharing. That's good. So people go in Chicago. Sorry, it seems I'm not sharing anything. Sorry. All right. Yes, thank you, and I apologize for not this not being on. Uh, yes, I, this is uh, Amino Dole, Tinche Amino Dole in Kashan. And uh, I was saying that we used to come and sketch and take pictures and uh, see a lot, a lot of these buildings, but they were like beautiful uh, uh, objects remaining from the past and when in the School of Architecture in Tehran, uh, we thought, uh, we never thought that they may be a source of inspiration or something to learn from because the rush of West was so strong that uh, the only buildings we used to see, which was in Architecture Aujourd'hui that used to come to Tehran those days, uh, a French architectural magazine. And uh, the other publications that we saw uh, in public media, which lim was limited to television those days. And uh, that was all. The importance of how this space, but I, it amazes me now that how they had created this what kind of expertise created this complex geometry of this dome covering its big span? Apart from that, how does it sit in the texture of the town in a most uh, lively way? That means people are constantly passing through it. People are meeting under this. It's really a covered made up. Uh, referring to what uh, Susan was, Dr. Bobby was mentioning. Uh, now I have lost, uh, Shaya John, I've lost my technical. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now I want to say creating of these ma masterpieces at our time, uh, I think was somehow forgotten. It is perhaps possible, but nobody has the uh, will to do that. 
uh, why I think after coming, one of the important issues that changed the picture of the architecture in our country and all the world was the introduction of new materials, like uh, in, the, in Iran, the steel beams uh, that uh, they could cover big spans without arches. And uh, you, you didn't need, and you could do it much faster and you didn't know, uh, didn't need the experts to uh, do a cover like this dome in uh, 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 so these are all I think uh, we should not go back and wish to be again to this kind of masterpieces uh, but try our own uh, way because it's not only us now there are hundreds of years in front of us we look forward with new technologies and new designs that architects will bring in. However, something is very important. Something that we have to see is the scale of human being, that it's always the element that is using these spaces. And this proportion of the space to the size of a person and uh, the way you, they manage the light as it's uh, one good example here and the materials they use and the sequence of spaces that you see in a, uh, plan of this marketplace. The, this is the plan of this dome, but it is completely interconnected with the traffic of the bazaar. This is the bazaar and you come in talking about the sequence of spaces, you go in through a gate and then HT, which is a limited lower space and then you open to this huge uh, space, like a fusion of space, and you continue out to the to market if you want, and or there are other connections out the other ways. Uh, this uh, sequence of space, which I say, because the proportions of these spaces, each of them are different, the shapes are different. It is, and when you travel, you remember, when you walk through them, uh, the human mind records these forms. And when you walk through, it's like combination of these uh, spaces together. And that is why you feel, I think, that you feel you are in a pleasant space and you are in a beautiful space. And doing this, doesn't mean that you always have to do these details of beautiful details and everything. It is mostly the space that you have. For me, I try to create that, to have these uh, different proportions, different directions of light, different materials uh, to give this pleasure to the user that comes in. Now I go back to another uh, element uh, which in Persian architecture is the element of Avon that you have a room, it's a huge room. In this case, this room has only three walls. The fourth wall is facing Dajle and is, is a uh, as it was before. And uh, so I want to say this idea of Avon uh, has been uh, in the architecture of Iran because it's uh, because of uh, our uh, climate and other issues that I'll go through this. So, in, in one project, this is the embassy of Iran in China, I have 
try to bring in uh, this idea of Avon at the entrance to invite you in. And the uh, geometry appears in the ceiling of the Avon. This is another Avon, Chair Sutun in Esfahan. And I see this in Yale University uh, that uh, Norman Foster has done something in that line to put a, a kind of Avon under which he has his functions. Uh, and this Avon is sometimes leads to the entry. This is the handicraft center in Tehran, which leads to a hashti. Uh, which can go, uh, can continue to another courtyard, or in your left, you enter a corridor. Now, this I chose these slides because now I'm still working with the material that the masons of Iran used to work with, which is the brick. Uh, this brick continues here and uh, continue, goes to a central dome, uh, like a central plaza of a little town, which is here, the uh, Mirase Farhangi or the handicraft center of Tehran, uh, in Tehran. Uh, but you see, uh, by the time I, would, I designed it, I think uh, we used the last craftsmen of uh, um, brickwork, but fortunately they still work in Iran and I hope they continue uh, practicing their skill. Now, I want to switch from brick to concrete. This is the three underground uh, underpass for access to Meidan Azadi or Meidan Shayat from the two sidewalks of the, uh, of, uh, the plaza into the main plaza because with the circle of the roads around it, it's impossible for anybody uh, to get to the inside of, uh, of the Maidan. And I think the problem with uh, most of the issues that uh, Dr. Babari mentioned uh, is the overtaking of cars uh, in the urban pattern of the modern life, uh, something that should be modified, I should say. Uh, so this is the section of the, of the underpass, which is inspired by the domes and the rhythm of architecture uh, in Iran, in, instead of brick in concrete. Uh, this is a view of inside the uh, underpass just before uh, turning towards the plaza. And this fountain in the middle is now dry uh, and they have put shops in the, they have really changed the uh, purpose of it. Maybe that was the requirement. When you come, you know, there are, that sequence of the space uh, in the plaza in Shahiyot, Medani Shahiyot, it you go from that uh, underground pa passageway and come up into the garden itself, into the plaza itself, and then you go to a smaller courtyard. Um, I couldn't cover the whole thing in this short time. And then you enter the tunnel to go to the basement of the uh, monument itself. Uh, something again, reminiscent of the thing. And then of reminiscent of bazaars. And uh, now I come back to a section of the Shahiyot itself. Uh, it shows the intricate uh, um, stonework under it uh, and the uh, other spaces inside. Um, this is another view of what is inside Shahiyat. Uh, you have uh, the, th this arch, the entry arch, 
uh, which uses the rasmi sozi or uh, karbandi uh, tricks of Iranian masons, which they, they had a question of how to uh, solve the corner of a Shabestan or a big room, which is the square room. How do you put a round dome over it? And the corners that the circle is not meeting uh, with the edges of the square, how do you fill it up? And the Masons of Iran has uh, innovated or they have created uh, thousands of solutions, all of them in a very beautiful way. I can't cover them, but the trick uh, of coming from a straight line, uh, here a straight line, to a curved uh, top, uh, is the same trick that has been employed here in this uh, monument in Shariyat. Uh, however, it's completely unprecedented and new. Uh, uh, so I want to say there are ideas in the past that inspires the architect who at the beginning of his uh, design, uh, he's in a, like me, in a very dark room, uh, not knowing where he wants to go. Sometimes the uh, looking at the past, it gives you a, a way to enter. And I think here I uh, uh, owe it a lot to the past architecture of Iran. And it, so this is another space above the uh, archway that I will write. This, this space here uh, is like a bridge over the uh, main vault, uh, which you see the, the, the main vault here and uh, the little uh, openings in the grid of that uh, intricate uh, carbandi under the uh, under the vault, here appearing as uh, points of light, and then uh, the bridge connecting the two sides uh, and the body and the. Uh, ceiling of the room, which is uh, again, another uh, manifestation of uh, a Persian way of organizing or carbon, the organizing the uh, structural elements here with concrete. They used to it, they used to do it with brick. Um, all right, so another view of that room, through which you see the, the dome that I showed in that uh, other uh, picture. Uh, this dome is the kind of uh, culmination of the space there, poured with white concrete uh, and it takes the light in from the top and it's not in brick this time, it's in white concrete. but never comes to what inspired us uh, to this dome in Bazaar of Yaz, uh, which was all done in brick. And uh, the pattern under the dome of the Sheikh Lotfullah. I just want to mention how this can be, or it was for me, a source of inspiration, the pattern of the Maidan Azadi which comes from the pattern under the dome of, you see this uh, somehow. You see the garden here, uh, the, the actual maidan, the access and the approach to the main, this is where you go down to a small courtyard 
again, uh, you organize this space. Uh, the experience of the user is always in your mind. And it's like uh, making a sculpture in space, uh, which is that one, but this is sculpture that your user is walking in. Uh, now, it is, uh, uh, this is a small work of Frank Gehry, somebody I respect a lot, in uh, Santa Monica, California. Uh, a small lot, and he had a program of a little shopping center. And he created, the, this is the main road, the main street. And he has created a little alley here with an interesting uh, perspective to this hall. And then another alley brings you back to the street again. Uh, And this is the view of that place, uh, which uh, for me, it was first uh, many, many years ago. Now I think he does everything perfectly. <laughs> I, I really respect his way and his ideas. Uh, but you see, uh, he has different elements, which are mostly there for their visual impact, uh, which was something that I think we should not forget. We, I, I think the visual impact is one of the functions of urban design. It is not uh, to be forgotten. Uh, and this is the perspective of a little alley in Yazd, uh, which I chose this uh, slide uh, just because of several issues that I see in it. Uh, this is a Badgir, which is a wind tower, uh, which was functional in ventilating the house and cooling the house in hot summers of Yaz. Uh, we, anyway, that's a different uh, discussion, what it is, but uh, you see that he has, uh, the, the owner has now the uh, chimney of his heater coming out of this, uh, which shows the conflict of the old way of living and the new way equipments that they have here. Uh, and uh, for his heater, he needs events and the vent is being brought up to the highest level of the house. And uh, the, he, he has uh, put uh, marble around his entrance door. The door, instead of being wooden, is a metal door. Uh, and uh, anyway, and uh, this uh, sign up there, which is Chayotia uh, Turan, which is a uh, uh, tailor shop or house. I, the last point, I don't want to be too long. This is uh, just to remind us that they were always uh, cognizant of uh, being in coordination with environment and sustainability. That was really the uh, climate and the harsh environment they used to live in and make the urban uh, textures in uh, had to comply with nature. Otherwise they couldn't survive. Uh, and these principles of sustainability uh, rules in all the Iranian towns and architecture, including the protection of water, respect with water and not letting it to be uh, just going wayward. It is always contained in this beautiful manner uh, and covered for the best use. And uh, sometimes this has been repeated in the Azadi or Shahiyad uh, Maidan. Uh, 
And uh, I think I can finish with this and uh, we can uh, be ready to discuss or I would love to hear your views about what was said. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Amonat, for the fascinating of uh, your engagement with uh, architecture. And uh, thank you to all of the uh, panelists. Uh, I would uh, pose one question and uh, then um, uh, my co-moderator would ask her question and we will open up to uh, Q and A uh, for all the attendees. Um, you started your uh, talk, Mr. Amanat, by um, recounting your um, um, memory of um, going to that team chair during your school years, uh, if I understood that uh, correctly. Yes. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could share with us um, more about uh, your uh, experience at, at school when when you really entered the scene in the late 60s, right? So my guess is that by the early and mid uh, 60s, you, you were um, uh, experiencing a very fruitful time with your, um, uh, with your uh, school. And um, I know that uh, you have written very fondly, particularly of um, your teacher, Mr. Uh, Hushang Sehun. And I was wondering um, in what ways what you think became your first decade was uh, shaped by, by the atmosphere of this school that you were going to? Uh, I, uh, yes. Um, I, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm so glad uh, Sehun's name has been brought up by dear Tallinn and yourself, uh, because he was the one that was so much in love with Iranian architecture, and he passed this to all the students. Uh, however, the, the spirit of the school being a bizarre style school, that's my, because um, our school was started by uh, uh, a great architect, uh, Monsieur Godard, uh, he started School of Architecture of Terror at the time of Reza Shah. And then uh, Mr. Mohsen Furuki, uh, the son of the Prime Minister of Iran those days, not those days, but the famous guy at the time of Reza Shah, he uh, came after him. And uh, Mohsen Furughi brought, uh, you know, a lot of uh, bizarre graduates to, to be professors in our school. One of them uh, was Mr. Aftan Delian, uh, whom I'm not sure, Tallinn, where he studied. I, he may be from Russia, but I don't know. Uh, Mr. Aftan Delian and uh, Sehun and Heydar Qiyayi, who has designed the Senate building mm. of Iran. Uh, he has done significant buildings too. Uh, and, uh, but the spirit of the school at the time, as I mentioned, uh, we were mostly trying to catch up with the West. Uh, uh, and the importance of what was within our touch, uh, except of the beauty and the nostalgic feeling you had from it, uh, was not uh, logically brought on. That means nobody started to analyze how the, the markets in Tehran and Bazaar will work and why they are so vital. And, uh, uh, but gradually, and I'm glad now in Iran, the architects, the Iranian architects are very informed. They are very skilled. They're good architects. And they 
are aware of the trends of the world, the importance of the life of pedestrian in, in this urban uh, texture that uh, uh, Dr. Babai mentioned. Uh, this is thing, but I think the political elements are most important. There should be a will that the architect mm. can put his uh, uh, ideas in. Uh, if there is not, there was a will by Shah Abbas <laughs> that ended up with that Maidan. Uh, otherwise, who was, uh, who could do that? It was his will and his power uh, that resulted in that beautiful piece. This is unique in the world even now. Uh, so uh, this, but you know, uh, I, I just answering your, I'm, we, we were on a panel of, uh, uh, about Bart Gears and Sulan Roof, who is a, a professor in, in one of the universities in Scotland. He was there and she, she was there and she had lived in Iran. She said uh, that the Iranians have a gene of architecture. And I really think anybody who, who is in the School of Architecture in Iran, they learn the tools of reflecting the imagination. And if they are directed correctly, like what Susan mentioned in terms of uh, life of a pedestrian, if they are directed correctly, they would create masterpieces. It is very, and if they are doing it, they, are, they have done uh, in, Island of Hormuz, mm. they have done a little uh, resort. You have to look at it and see how original it is, how it is in, in the lack of abilities or uh, possibilities in that remote island in Persian Gulf. Uh, they have done something which I think it goes back to the skills of, so the skills of Iranian architects who are trained in the schools that you are asking. Of. I want to say whatever the concept and the main uh, trend was those days, the way they teach and the way they train the students seems to be a correct way. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I have a question for all the panelists um, that have spoken today, and it relates back to the general theme of this panel, which is about the um, carrying over of traditions into modernity and what the relationship has been of tradition and modernity in architectural development. And everyone has spoken about that, but one theme that seems to stick out is um, the opposition between pedestrian access and vehicular or car traffic and how that really defines um, uh, what modernity might be. And I think it's important to think about how tradition can, maybe isn't in opposition to vehicles, but how have we seen any sort of success in integrating vehicular traffic into a traditional form? Um, I mean, uh, Dr. Babai, you of course talk about how the Maidan is completely changed by car traffic um, uh, composing the new Maidan of Tehran. And even um, Dr. Gregor, when you're talking about um, architecture kind of taking the place of the of kings in terms of a performance of voyeurism. Is it possible that arch, that vehicles and cars allow one to create the city as a, as a maidan at a larger scale, um, and that cars actually work into this idea of a traditional maidan, but in a contemporary context? And of course, um, Messer Amanat, when you're talking about one of your projects in particular with the pedestrian underpass, 
we see a, a big distinction being made between spaces that are made for pedestrians and spaces allocated for cars. Um, and of course, the conversation of pedestrian um, uh, processions through spaces becomes very important to your analysis of traditional architecture. And um, so going back to the question, is there a way that we can not think of cars and vehicles as an opposition to traditional Iranian architecture? And are there examples of how they're integrated um, successfully? I think Dr. Babari is here. <laughs> I, I just was going to ask what kind of order of appearance would you prefer? I, I, it's interesting, the question you're raising um, at a time when we are so keenly aware of uh, the climate change and ecological concerns and cars are part of the issue, of course, uh, until they can, be, they can be safe in terms of uh, climate. Um, and it's interesting to think, I, I think back at what um, uh, Hossein John said about scale and the intimacy and the way in which the human figure uh, has been um, in theories that have never been written down, the scale against which uh, design of cities and spaces have taken place in, in Iran to begin with, you know, that those uh, team chair, those crossings of, of uh, bazaars uh, like the one in Koshan are absolutely grand in the sense of the complexity of the design, even the, the height of the space, but they never lose uh, the individual figure of a passerby. And one doesn't lose the intimacy, sense, sense of intimacy. It, it's really striking to think that in, for instance, European cities, the urge to pedestrianize uh, thoroughfares actually. Uh, now in London, there is discussion about Oxford Street, at least in part, becoming pedestrianized. All those double deckers will have to go somewhere else, obviously, or Strand becoming a pedestrian neighborhood. These are major thoroughfares when you think about it. Uh, but they are, um, there is that notion of link between the individual, the pedestrian, the eye as it sees, as it encounters these spaces, the light, the, the sort of social functions and what the street or the uh, Maidan may offer. The Maidan in principle is a, an incredibly important spatial organizer of human activity. And it is functional when it comes to being a place where you transfer traffic to so many major streets and link up with other Maidans. There's really a huge network that is determining what Tehran, for instance, in its modernization has taken shape. Uh, but it is still a highly questionable methodology, which uh, now the question of social space, the question of urban development, uh, perhaps need to rethink it. I'm not an urban planner. Urban planners are thinking about these things all the time. Uh, but it seems to me that, that some of those lessons of the past are worth revisiting for the purposes of the future. And I think that's what uh, Mr. Amonat was hinting, at, not hinting, actually talking about it, the way in which one learns from those pasts towards really modern present and future. There's nothing wrong with that. I agree with you. There's no inherent, perhaps, uh, dis disruption or disjointedness but as it stands right now, that kind of a wholesale uh, submission to the car, for instance, uh, has taken away the opportunity. Uh, Talin must have much more to say about that. This is not anti-modernist, obviously, right? <laughs> um, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Thank you, Susanja, for your um, insight. Uh, my take on this is that 
oh, I'm a little bit wary of uh, these extremes of um, um, sort of things were happening, uh, Iranian architects were doing things that uh, Europeans were doing, or that there's no agency in what their choices. Um, and also that these transformations were, yes, under Reza Shah, they were rapid. I mean, it was sort of uh, a fadman from above, uh, from some ministry. Um, and um, our, most architects, although they try to keep uh, in independence and create a independent professional um, um, environment for them, uh, these transformations were happening actually slowly. I mean, we have to see them as a, a long sort of starting from uh, Nasser Din Shah period, ending with and continuing to, to today. Uh, so the evolution of the Maidan, the, the superior or the, the uh, transformation of the Maidan, the Safavid Maidan into a uh, Hosmanian Maidan, uh, the introduction of the car, the, um, then you have all of a sudden this unmanageable, anyone who has been in, to Tehran in the last 30 years, really sort of overwhelming, unmanageable volume of uh, cars. And uh, so uh, I think we should really give agency to the architects. I really think they knew what they were doing based on what was happening, not only in Europe, but also in Iran. They were always aware of uh, um, their own environment, um, and their own history, although they had certain preferences or principles that was pushing them at that moment, given the larger sociopolitical environment. So the transformations that are happening in the 1930s, they're not just in urban, they're not just um, uh, uh, educational. 1930s was really a transformational um, and it was a holistic, um, uh, uh, almost sort of not only sociopolitical, but aesthetic experience. To be modern, we keep wanting to define what modern is, but I, I find that uh, not very useful. Uh, modern is what modern does in a way. I mean, if you wanted at some point to be modern, you would get a car, you would dress in a certain way, you would hire an architect to do an international style building for you. There were a series, you would go to the cinema. You So there were serious things, choices that individuals and the society, uh, stratas of the society made that made them modern. And I think we need to understand modernism in Iran that includes urban transformations and architectural transformations based on these choices. Ultimately, it comes down to, uh, for example, Susan's parents who retired from Abadan, they came to Tehran, they had this retirement bulk of money from the oil company. What do I wanna do? I, I don't wanna live in an old Ajar building because I'm used to what the British, <laughs> British the, the Abadan architecture. So I'm gonna hire Oshana, who's gonna design for me a modern, uh, an international style building. And the car goes with it, the education goes with it, the way they dress and their manners goes with it. So uh, I think it's very useful to see these periods of transformation in a larger holistic, uh, cultural transformation that everything is happening at the same time and people are making conscientious decisions about their own lives that then sees from it's seen from outside as modern. Uh, and uh, Tali, in this, uh, you are quite right. I think the only thing I think uh, can be added to this is a vision that you create by this wish or urge of the way the people are mixing with each other. For example, Piazza Navona in uh, Rome, uh, 
uh, you you are there and you really feel or Meidan Khan in Yazd. For me, they all have something to learn. But we want to go back uh, and see what is the spirit, what is uh, the way that this intermixing uh, spaces have been created. And can we work towards that? Can we work towards a society that is this kind of uh, human spaces? Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm out of place, but I just wanted to add something uh, to what Talin said. It is, um, my parents weren't retired yet. <laughs> they were working still at the time. <laughs> but what I wanted to say was, in fact, um, your point is really well taken in the sense that there is a wish to be modern, quote unquote. Uh, one of the conditions of that was and remains uh, the sort of stratification of society into moderns and anti-moderns or not moderns or even, you know, old fashioned traditionalists. And that's one of the points that I think that vision might be I mean, this vision is, it includes a great many people. It's not an individual who hires a modernist architect who makes that vision. That vision is narrowly focused on that particular, let's say, family's um, self-assessment, self-representation and so forth. But the vision, which would be, um, more of a collective vision, perhaps, which I imagine that's what Hussein is referring to, something that, you know, Shah Abbas did have a vision, not alone with a whole bunch of other people, uh, but, but there is a vision there. And, and, you know, the development of old cities, we call them organic developments, as if, you know, uh, it just somehow grew out of nowhere. But that, that sort of, uh, I mean, the vision of modernism, of course, drove what you're talking about in the particularly the 30s, which is fascinating on so many levels. But was it also capable of carrying that vision across the board? And that's one of the questions that comes out of thinking about the past and the present at any cut of time, right? In the say 30s, in fact, or 40s. And, and whether these uh, uh, stratifications of society are, are uh, in fact the result of it or are capable of being uh, uh, evened out. I don't think, for instance, the, the American city and suburban divide helped anybody in terms of fi fixing these so social distinctions, right? We all know inner city, what happens to inner cities in America where uh, suburbs have become white and wealthy over time. So it's a question of how does it work for a place like Iran? How did it work? How good was it after all? And, and you know, what is the result of it? Um, I'm, I'm not asking you to, to uh, justify it, but it's a question of uh, are the vision, is the vision collective actually? Fabodia, unmute. I just want to say, uh, Talin, would you want to uh, follow up on Dr. Susan? Um, uh, Baba's comments. Um, I I agree. Um, I absolutely agree, and I also agree with uh, uh, Mr. Amanat that um, I uh, so we I I totally agree with the vision, and we could even I might dare to argue that Shah Abbas was a modernist in that sense. His vision was a modern vision. A modernist vision, um, and that in and then going back to the sixties, with the demise of this kind of orthodox modernism, the international style that was um, uh, abandoned, um, 
you have a new generation of architect um, uh, like Mr. S uh, uh, Amanat, who, who again in seeing seeing modernism as this uh, long trajectory, they they then they are faced with the practical problems of of what the earlier generation had done. Um, and, and seeing that drawing uh, everything, history, um, uh, especially Iranian history, architectural history that is so rich out is not working for Iran. So then they go, they're not, in my opinion, they weren't looking for what later is called traditional architecture, therefore creating this, oh, they were modernists, they were traditionalists. They were actually looking for um, modern pro um, solutions to modern problems. And that to me is very modern. What uh, the extraordinary building that is Shahyad or the, ex and, and, and the uh, other examples, the other uh, struggles to come up with the Iranian modernism that has connections to its rich history, the Safavid and, and before, um, it's a deeply modernist endeavor. Um, and so I have, my, my issue is this post everything happens and then you start to divide and label this, these people are, were modernists, these people were traditionalists. I think whoever struggles with uh, coming up with uh, contemporary forms or urban solutions, um, they are being modern just like Shabbos. But all taken in, you are quite right. We are holding this kind of panels and everything to define our way to future for a community like Iran, which has to be really should have a plan, which because of different factors now socially in Iran, these are forgotten. Uh, we want, because the duty of architect and planner and is just to uh, create visionary spaces and towns for human beings to live in. And if you are honestly looking at everything, and you know, I think it's important, for example, an architect should not be thinking of pretension, <laughs> he, he should go to the truth of building and not to try to create a facade for everything. I mean, here that means something that is not connected to what the building is and how building, how people, users are affected by it. He should be aware in total honesty with all these spiritual and material requirements of the users, of the people designing, then sustainability becomes a very important factor, something that is vital now in Iran. And many other aspects that has really uh, formed Iranian towns and in the modern movement because of technical possibilities we got and requirements. Uh, it was all uh, somehow, it lost its importance, I should say. But the vision, one of the parts of this vision is this sustainability to move in, in that direction. I think that's an excellent point. And I think that also ties into some questions that we have from um, the audience. Um, one of the questions, I think, although it's it's general, but you're speaking to Mr. Amanat, is about how do we think about design in the future? Um, how can we incorporate more of our spirit of traditional architecture um, in our new designs? And especially when we're thinking about sustainability, is it important to be able to identify contemporary architecture as um, Persian architecture? Um, are there aspects of sustainability in design in traditional Persian architecture that will continue to um, 
sparked the idea of a Persian pre-modern past um, that should be continued into uh, the future of architecture. Uh, yes, I, uh, you are quite right in uh, the answer, you know, if you bring sustainability in a new building, you don't have to, uh, you know, it's the question of if, if you know about the lead, which is the principles of being green in architecture and uh, careful about energy and uh, sustainability. Uh, the principles of lead, most of them, you find in the old buildings of Iran because the control of light, uh, importance of natural light in spaces, uh, avoiding the direct sunshine on windows, for example, uh, and uh, sustainability in terms of traffic. Uh, you know, you have access uh, to traffic uh, points. Uh, through walking and what is your distance. Uh, all of them and the material being local, they used to take the mud and make the buildings. Uh, here we import from thousands of kilometers uh, to building buildings. Uh, it may have to be there, but uh, I think any architect when he uh, decides decisions in the buildings. Uh, he would, he should have these principles of sustainability in mind, and I think this is uh, what. You know, it's nothing about Iran only. You, you are a member of the world, and you think about the questions of the world. Then, if you are working in Iran, you have to fit it in the. Uh, climate of Iran in the context of where you work. If you consider that, it becomes Iranian. <laughs> it's, uh, if, you, if you consider the factors of India in your design, it becomes an Indian design. And it doesn't need to, and it may be that you, uh, you apply the principles of international design. I'm designing high rises in uh, San Diego. All right, so what do I uh, practice from my background in it? I think what I do practice, first of all, is the scale of the person in a building. And uh, the sequence of the space, again, always comes uh, automatically. And uh, the rest of it is really in international market is uh, controlled by factors of lead, for example, if you know the, the regulations for being sustainable, uh, which is now uh, one of the ways of getting to sustainable building. Don't want to be on this speaker. <laughs> All right. Would you like to read another question, Summer? Uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, so just comment that uh, the story of uh, parents coming back uh, um, from Abadan. It is um, Dr. Babai and uh, Talin could have been talking about my parents um, when my father um, retired. Um, and while my mother was still working, they came back to their hometown of Shiraz. And I totally agree with uh, how uh, Talin was describing it as how the choices that were being made, the choices they made was not to move to the old um, part of the city, the neighborhood that they came from originally, that called that was a Saadi, but they the, the choice of having still cars and so on. And I was wondering if, if uh, this is something that we can probably talk later about this. Are we talking about an ecosystem that is as a larger environment that is um, producing the cosmopolitan um, national subject in, in a sense so that it goes from school to work to 
to entertainment and, and so on. Um, this is a question by um, Said P. Roos, uh, that, um, uh, I'm sorry, Said uh, Amini Zodefard, uh, that um, you might have answered it somewhat before telling, but this is addressed to you. Uh, do you see modern Tehran without any connection to traditional Iranian architecture? Or you see modern architecture of Iran similar to modern architecture of Europe in a dialogue with the traditional one, classicism, God, romantic, etc. By that, I, I think what the, the, the person who is posing the question talks about the Iran of today. Um, uh, I, I cannot comment too much about the Iran of today. Uh, because a lot is going on, very diverse things are going on in the Iran of today. Um, but certainly in the um, first and second Pahlavi era, um, again, I take issue with this notion of traditional architecture. I don't think there is such a thing as traditional architecture. Every time that someone built something, they felt that they were being new and modern. Um, uh, so. I do think that there are, they were individual architects like Gevrekian and Vartan and uh, uh, um, some of them were reject, intentionally rejecting any history because that was one of the tenets of the modern movement. You throw away history, it has no use to us. You start everything from new, um, but then you have other architects like Furughi and Zafar, and they are for specific architectural pieces like uh, Reza Shah's tomb. They are looking back at, uh, at um, Sasanian fire temples and re, re uh, appropriating that, which was already had, which had already been appropriated by the Samanids and others as funerary monument, fire temple to funerary monument. And now they are putting a modernist um, um, mask on it. So we, I think we, this question cannot be answered whole, just, just as, a, as a rule of 20th century history. I think that um, every architect based on their own background, by, based on their own um, uh, design principles, we're trying to do something and at the outcome, what we are left with are uh, these forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we enter into dialogue with that history through the interpretation of these forms. Um, very few of them left uh, diaries and manifestos and because they were primarily building. Susan. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to take what Talin is saying and, and also going back to what Hossein said earlier and uh, recast this perhaps in light of not so much a, a binary of the tradition and the modern, but a, an understanding of the more, um, a more worldly vision that has always been part of the conversation. It comes out of our thinking that uh, the modern is European, it's Western essentially, and that that is the straight jacket with which we are forced to, within which we are forced to to work. And that may very well be where the flaw is because it naturally puts an oppositional position with regards to whatever was there in the past, call it traditional, call it historical, whatever we were to talk about. That that is where the, the sort of the, in my, in my understanding of it, this goes for the arts, it goes for all other manifestations that Iranians of the 20th century or 19th century are as much part of a world consciousness, world movement, as are the, the French and are the Japanese. And that assumption that somehow uh, Europe, the West holds the right to what is new, what is modern, 
is one of the preconditions with which we are forced to work. The very fact that the architects Tallinn talks about may have trained in Europe uh, and come back to do this modernist style or that they have been studying what was the modernist uh, ethos doesn't make this an alien concept. We, you know, we always think about these things uh, that for instance, what is learned from China is somehow the influence of China. Iran has always been a place embracing of things coming from elsewhere, adapting, adopting, transforming, and making it its own essentially. And this is true in all kinds of other transculturation exercises. And I, it really is, it goes to the heart of what Talin was saying, but also what Hussein was saying about the sort of the people of the world kind of a thinking, right? And then you adjust it to Iran or India or wherever it is that you need to, to situate it. And that really, I agree with Talin, uh, find something other than traditional sonetti, whatever we say, in order for us to really understand uh, the modern, not as a Western import or imposition, but as an adaptation of a, um, a sort of a local rethinking of its own place. And I think Obodan is a great example. I grew up in British built houses and neighborhoods, but you know, I, I recognize how that shapes my, the geometry of my thinking perhaps. But then I also grew up in Tehran. It, it's this, this kind of a merging of these ideas that really makes the, the new persons, call them whatever we want to call them. Thank you. I think a lot of um, the answers to this evolving discussion um, uh, and conversation that's come up answer some of the questions that many of the um, attendees have posed. Um, earlier. So thank you for, for addressing this topic and the main point of the panel being about how we define uh, modern versus pre-modern um, contemporary architecture as we move forward in the profession, but also how we historicize it and contextualize it. Um, I think what is interesting to think about from all the presentations is that regardless of how we want to define modern modernity in Persian architecture, um, or not define it, there's still a conversation of spatial rhythm that has been consistent, whether it's um, talking about the spatial rhythm of the pedestrian walking through spaces that is important to Messer Amanat's um, design ethos, um, or if it's about um, the spatial rhythm of the individual as they move through the Maidan, um, or the, I think what's also interesting is when we think programmatically and Dr. Gregor's presentation about the rise of schools and institutions as part of this modernist period um, is also a type of rhythm and ordering that is present in a form of, of modern architecture, even if it's not um, as apparently form making, it still is influencing you know, a modernist tradition. Um, so despite these consistencies in talking about spatial rhythm in the conversation of tradition and modernity and architecture, it is interesting to see how we continue to debate what um, and, and if we can differentiate between pre-modern architecture and modern architecture and Persian uh, design. And I think this kind of continues a, a, a discussion that I hope we can have in the future that is um, problematizes the difference between historians and practitioner, practitioners in the sense that historians have the, the privilege of being able to um, not define, necessarily have to define what the difference is between tradition and modernity, um, and also can look at the past and re recontextualize all that information, whereas architects are having to make the decision and set the tone that will be part of this historical narrative in the future. So we have this constant issue of we don't want to define, we're in this, this 
um, postmodern mentality of not wanting to define what modernity and tradition is and that that maybe it's not even important to make those differentiations, but architects still have to be the ones who are physically manifesting these changes. And um, I, I find that interesting and I, I look forward to hearing how we will continue to write the history of Persian architecture, um, keeping in mind the ideas of sustainability um, and how that's implemented in all contemporary architectural design moving forward. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who is on the panel. I really appreciate it. I think this was an excellent discussion and I love seeing architectural discussions within a history department um, and specifically in the context of Persian architecture. And um, thank you to all the uh, attendees who posed very interesting questions that I think and I hope that we have begun to address. Um, and this was a great way to end this academic year um, in the series of, of um, discussions within um, the department and hosted by um, uh, Dr. Amanat. So thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.